All right, so welcome to the third presentation in Unit 5. Uh, it's titled Breaking Bonds. Um, our learning goals for this uh, section, uh, students will describe the changes in energy for chemical reactions, classify reactions as endothermic and exothermic, uh, and lastly, describe real-world applications of endothermic and exothermic reactions. Now, what we should know coming into this, um, chemical reactions follow the law of conservation of mass, and so the mass of our product is going to equal the mass of the reactants. And some reactants re reactions release energy, and some reactions require energy. Now, what we learned in the lab, uh, chemical reactions can lower the surrounding temperature, and chemical reactions can raise the surrounding temperature. But whether, regardless of whether they lower or raise the temperature, energy is conserved. Now, in chemistry, um, we we classify energy. It's defined as the ability to do work. Um, work is applying a force capable of moving an object. The, the big thing for us here in chemistry is that chemical bonds store energy. So we have what we call chemical potential energy that is stored in chemical bonds. Um, and that's really the energy we're talking about is that chemical potential energy that molecules are capable or they're capable of combining uh, those positive and negative charges. And so those positive and negative charges, um, we know that light charges repel, but opposite charges attract. And so energy is stored in that position of that holding that positive and that negative together that we create this chemical potential energy and it's all about the positives and the negatives the cations and the anions now the conservation of energy it's like the conservation of mass and generally we we term or coin those things together it's the law of conservation of mass and energy that energy cannot be created or destroyed but converted from one form to another now energy is converted from potential energy to heat and from heat to chemical potential energy and so they're converted between the two things but energy is always conserved we don't ever lose energy so bond formation um, when we're looking at this chemical bonds have stored energy so if we look down here that that bond those those positive and negative attractions in those bonds they store that energy and energy must come from somewhere okay the law of conservation of energy says that if there's energy in those stored bonds they must have come from somewhere so where did it come from that free energy is removed from the environment so we didn't create the energy it's always been there but what it'll do is it'll it'll pull it from the environment and we can reverse that and essentially if we're breaking bonds we can put energy back into the environment so endothermic reactions endothermic reactions and here's a really good picture of it when you think of endothermic reactions think of those instant cold packs um, when you break them a chemical reaction takes place and you feel cold a very cold sensation that's an endothermic reaction um, it takes in heat so essentially uh, when you have an endothermic reaction what you want to think is you feel cold because that chemical reaction is pulling energy from your hand so if you're touching it and you feel that instant cold pack and it's cold it feels cold because it's pulling energy from your hand now energy is used in an endothermic reaction to form new chemical bonds so it's forming bonds in an endothermic reaction now the overall temperature decreases for the endothermic so you feel cold because it's pulling energy in from uh, your hand if you're touching it um, breaking bonds so chemical bonds have stored energy stored energy is released as the atoms are separated free energy is added to the environment so when we break bonds so the opposite of an endothermic reaction we're breaking bonds instead of forming them we release that energy as free energy uh, into the environment and that's an exothermic reaction an exothermic reaction gives off heat 
So a good example of that would be an instant hot pack. It's a chemical reaction that takes place and heat is released. You feel heat if you're touching that instant hot pack because it's releasing that energy into your hand or whatever it's touching. Now energy is, is comes from the breaking of those existing chemical bonds. So the chemical bonds that are stored, they release that energy. Now the overall temperature increases for an exothermic reaction. So our first fundamental question, how can a positive and a negative charge store energy? Well, what they're storing it in, and they're storing it in their, their attraction for each other. And so basically what happens is it pulls those molecules, those atoms together, and it stores it in position. So it's holding those two things together and it's storing that energy. Uh, developing level question. Uh, differentiate between an endothermic and exothermic reaction. An endothermic reaction, it feels cold because it's requiring energy. It's forming new bonds. Exothermic reaction, it feels hot because it's releasing energy. Proficient. If 200 joules of energy is released in an exothermic reaction, then how much energy was stored in the bonds? Well, if 200 joules of energy was re released in the exothermic, law of conservation of energy says if 200 joules was released, then that means that 200 joules was stored in those chemical bonds. And our last question for our mastery level question for this section, it says, the combustion of gasoline requires a spark. Why would an exothermic reaction require energy input? Well, what happens is that spark, what it does is it kind of gets it over um, what we call the activation energy. And you really don't need to know that term, but you just need to know that it needs a little bit to get going. So it needs a little bit of energy input and then it will export or, or be an exothermic reaction and just produce a lot of energy into the environment. So adding energy to equations. Energy can be added to chemical reactions. Endothermic reactions have energy heat as a reactant. And so if you see energy in the reactant side then you know that's an endothermic reaction. If you see energy in the product side then you know that it's an exothermic reaction. Um, and you can add these two chemical reactions to show that it is an endo or an exothermic reaction. It's just a nice way to put it in there so you can kind of see it. Now an endothermic uh, energy graph. So these energy graphs that we have, uh, the products have more energy stored up than the reactants. Uh, the peak is called the transition state and shows the reaction occurring. So this right here is the actual reaction. Okay. Now you know that it's an endothermic reaction because if you look, reactants are here, products are there. It's going up. So if it goes up, that means that it's, it's absorbed energy into those chemical bonds, and so therefore it's an endothermic reaction. And the way you can think of this, if, and it goes up here, it's going to be a positive number. If it's a positive number, if it goes up on this graph, that means it's positive, that means that energy went in, positive went in. Now an exothermic energy graph is exact opposite. The reaction, reactants have more energy stored than the products. And so the reactants are up on top, products are down low. Here's the reaction taking place again. It's right there. But what we see is we see that reactants are up, products are low, so therefore the graph went down. If the graph goes down, that means it's negative. That means it went out of the system. So it went out, so therefore it's hot. Um, and so similar graph, but just remember, if products are on the bottom, then that means it's exothermic. If products are on the top, that means it's endothermic. Now a catalyst, a catalyst lowers the energy of the transition state, but uh, does not change the product or the reactant. And so we see if we add a catalyst, basically you can see it's a little bit easier to get up that hill. So you can kind of think that this chemical reaction is like riding a bike. Well, that hill is really tall. So it takes a little bit more energy to kind of get going. Well, a catalyst, what it does is it makes the hill a little bit smaller, and that's a little bit easier to ride your bike up that hill, and so the reaction takes place faster. And that's why we say when we add a catalyst, we speed up the reaction. Well, what we actually do is we actually make it easier for the reaction to occur, and so it does speed it up.
a fundamental question here. It says, uh, do the products or reactants have more chemical bonds? So we're looking at this. Products are on top. Reactants are on bottom. This is an endothermic reaction. And in an endothermic reaction, that means it gained energy. If it gained energy, it gained it in the bonds. So there would be more bonds, chemical bonds, in our products than in our reactants. Next question, it says the combustion of gasoline raises the temperature of the surrounding air. Sketch a graph of the potential energy. Okay, so when we're looking at this, if we have our graph, let me draw that again. If we have our graph, what we would see is we would see reactants here. There's our reaction taking place. And then our products down here. It released that energy, so it went into the surroundings. It's an exothermic, that means that the, the Reactants are on top, products are on bottom, and that's what our graph should look like. Our next uh, example, B3, it says, how can you lower the temperature of the surrounding air and still conform to the law of conservation of energy? So we're lowering the temperature, it's absorbing the energy from the surroundings, but we still conform to the law of conservation of energy because that energy is no longer stored as heat, it's stored as chemical bonds. And our mastery level question that says the solution of copper sulfate is reacted with solid zinc, decreasing the temperature of the solution. Write a balanced chemical equation for this reaction. So here's pretty tough. We're writing a chemical reaction here. Uh, so we got copper sulfate, and this is probably copper 2 sulfate. So we're going to have our CuSO4 plus it's reacting with solid zinc. And we're going to write out, it's going to react, and that zinc's going to replace that copper. Copper is going to be by itself. And then we'll have our zinc sulfate. And if we look at that, everything's already balanced, and it's already done.